Welcome to this special session on peace and human security of WAS at 60. Thank you all. Uh, I, I see so many friendly faces, so many friends and members of the World Academy. Uh, I, I mean, I will not introduce you all because I think we will speak one after the other one. Uh, and uh, I will, Jonathan will spin off the discussion in a minute, but let me just mention the ones I see on screen. I see Azita Berar, uh, I see Tibor Tot, Dujan Vujovic, Katalin Bogiai, uh, um, Basa Samoyov, and Maria Fernanda Espinosa. Uh, is someone else, Gary, is with us or not? I'm not so sure. Uh, in any case, before we start, just to, uh, Gary is also with us. Great. The, uh, the intention that we have today is to, to have a reflection on human security. What is human security for all of us? Uh, a reflection as uh, a tool that we want to set in place, an operational concept that already exists to some extent, but that we want to promote. We want to promote further understanding of what human security is, uh, what it represents for all of us, as a framework for action. We all know that there are many areas that fall under human security. There is even a General Assembly, UN General Assembly resolution 66-290 that defines what human security is all about. And there it says that human security is an approach to assist member states and addressing, to, uh, to help them addressing um, issues of survival, of livelihoods, uh, of dignity of people. But, you know, if we go more in depth, if we, as practitioners, uh, as we all are, we want to understand what really human security is all about, in my views, we have to consider three aspects. One is basic needs. I mean, what are human basic needs? I mean, we are catering also towards people who have less than we do, and we need to uh, cater for their well-being. So when I say basic needs, in my opinion, is the well-being of people, and it includes health, it includes education, basic services. There is certainly an issue of equity. So what do we do to promote sound governance, local ownership, uh, uh, equitable rules and regulations, rule of law in general. I can see that Azita is smiling because she's a great expert in this field. And opportunities. This for me is the third point. Uh, that is, what do you do to promote economic and social opportunities? Uh, what do we do to really uh, empower people to have a better quality of life? So I think that around these concepts, we can reason, you can have, and you will have, your own interpretation of what is human security. We are very much interested in that uh, for one particular reason. Uh, well, first of all, because we all deal with that, but also because WAS, the World Academy, has been tasked by the United Nations, by the United Nations Human Security Unit, to uh, conduct a survey a survey on uh, to define a better understanding of human security itself. And we are currently doing that. We are currently doing that with many of the organizations that you do represent with uh, parliamentarians across the globe, with academic institutions, non-governmental organizations, youth organizations, and of course, member states and UN organizations. So we are currently doing this and by March 15, we will have the results of this current survey. We will analyze data and we'll produce a, a report that will be helpful later on for a larger project, what we call a global campaign uh, that will also have an element of training around the issue of human security. So you do understand that the World Academy, and this is a decision that has been taken by the board, is fully involved in with this approach. And we want to come up with something practical, something actionable. So we really confide on you 
on all participants today to give us good ideas. What is human security? How actionable that can be? And uh, with whom can we later on conduct a global campaign to support a better understanding of uh, human security in all its derivations and practical effects? So with these premises, I think Jonathan will spin off the discussion and uh, uh, then we will alternate John, my good friend Jonathan and I in uh, uh, giving the floor to all participants. Jonathan. Thank you. Well, uh, it, it's, it's axiomatic to all of us that we're at a critical moment with the entire human family. A hundred years ago, if somebody proposed that we would organize ourselves in such a way that we would melt the polar ice cap, it, it, they would have been laughed at. How could you possibly do this? How could you generate enough heat to do this? How could you actually change the Gulf Stream? It would, it would just seem preposterous, but we're doing it systematically. If somebody had said a hundred years ago that the military budget of the planet, of the countries of the planet, particularly driven by, by, by the United States, my home country, is verging on $2 trillion a year in the pursuit of security through the threat and use of military force, while such a, such a proportion of our human population lives in gross poverty. And that we're building new inventive ways of pursuing security by threatening human annihilation, it would have seemed preposterous. It would have seemed preposterous that we, that we would have a weapon, weapons that could, ultimate, could actually end humanity in an afternoon merely by using a small percentage of those weapons and that we're hell-bent, the major countries of the world are hell-bent on improving the capacity of nuclear weapons, improving their ability to destroy. And that the pursuit of meeting human needs by the two most important institutions of our time, the corporation, which galvanizes enormous amounts of human energy and resources for its purposes, and the state are both operating under, under premises that I would say are mythical. The, the state is operating with a focus on security, mainly on nationalism using military means. And the justification for the modernization of their horrific arsenals they are twofold. One is internationally, they say, we're pursuing strategic stability. We have to have these weapons for strategic stability. I call that the, the shiny white stallion. And then domestically in the debates as to how the state will provide security to its people, the political class of the major countries argues for military advantage. That by having military advantage, your state will have security and the people will have security. So the strategic stability is kind of like a, uh, like a turtle. It's very stable and slow. And military advantage is like that sharp stallion. It's, it's exciting, it's sexy, and there's profit to be made, and, any, and, and, and it attracts eyeballs. And in the debates domestically in the major countries, the dove of peace hardly gets in the room, the dove of disarmament. And we can see how marginalized it is in the fact that the United Nations Charter even tasks the military staff committees to get together to reduce military expenditures, to free up resources for social development as a duty of the Security Council in chapter five, article 26 of the charter. And it's never been invoked. It's right there in the very structure of the institution, but it doesn't have, it doesn't have the political will of the major countries because of the myths of military advantage and strategic stability. Both of them, both of them in derogation of meeting actual human needs and addressing the existential threats that we that I need to inform this, this community of 
of, uh, of, 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 the natural, of destroying the natural world and threatening annihilation. And the myth of our way of providing goods and services in daily life to people that the corporate world operates under is based on externalizing the natural world, not including it in realistic risk analysis or in bookkeeping and accounting, not realizing our, uh, our being part of the web of life as if, as if these entities that we've created have a ontological status more important than human beings. The, and the, that, so the premise of even how their accounting is done is based on a mythical construction, but more importantly, the core premise of perpetual growth, that, that perpetual growth is not the way the natural world works. A few hundred years ago, there was no garbage. Everything, everything in nature is part of a process of regeneration, of regeneration rather than, uh, you know, uh, cancer is essentially a perpetual growth organism within the body that you can't stop, that doesn't harmonize. So our economic premises based on perpetual growth is out of, out of harmony with the necessity of living in harmony with the natural world. And it's based on a myth. It's based on a story that we've created. The human security paradigm that focuses on how to meet the fullness of human needs is an idea that's transformative. And it goes to the very point that Donato raised, how do people live on, in their daily lives? And, uh, it, and, it, and it focuses on the needs of individual human beings. And it redirects the duty of the state to cooperate to address the existential threats of protecting our shared climate, our oceans, and uh, redirects the duty of the state to fulfill its first duty, to serve and protect its citizens, which cannot be done on an individual level any longer. We need global cooperation to actually fulfill the first duty of the state. So I'm pleased to say that, that the World Academy is uh, negotiating, and I feel, I feel confident we'll be able to fulfill that, to do a project with the United Nations to advance and mainstream a redirecting of how we define security and thus a redirecting of the debate amongst and within states and a redirecting of how international relations are taught, how economics is taught, how military planning is taught, and focus instead of the perpetual growth of corporations in the realm of economics, and instead of militarism and nationalism as the core premise of the state, not that we don't need militaries and that nations are not important. We're not saying do away with these institutions, but they should be in proportion to meeting the core needs of the people. And one could say that the integrated human security agenda that we saw in the world summits of the 1990s, which laid the, the, the backbone of the Millennium Development Goals and now in the Sustainable Development Goals is a really good template to, to move toward. But it will, we will not fulfill those goals until we have that, this change of direction. And hopefully this discussion will, uh, will add to that and we'll find more commitments and more ideas. I know some of the people on this call have exemplified in their careers examples of inst institutionalization of real human security uh, agendas. I've directly seen uh, Maria Espinoza take that kind of leadership role at, in, when she was the president of the General Assembly. I've seen Tibor Toth do that in the way he created the and, and advanced the institutional structure of the Comprehensive T Test Ban Treaty Organization. And I've seen Alan Ware uh, create a network of parliamentarians with like-minded, with a like-minded attitude. And I'm sorry, I don't know the I don't know well the rest of uh, our panelists, but I know with three of them, they are examples of people who've actually brought these ideas into practice. And with that, I. I'm uh, happy to hand, hand over uh, the choreography to my good friend Donato. 
Thank you very much, Jonathan, for so eloquently, eloquently explaining, I mean, what human security is nowadays uh, and reminding us also of the various existential threats uh, that we have to cope with. Well, we have an imminent one, COVID, that is changing our life uh, and that we have certainly to cope with uh, beyond all the other uh, threats that we're already accompanying our lives every day. Uh, so I, uh, with, with, with your uh, mm, mm, spin-off and more with, the, with the, you know, questions, basic questions that I tried to raise in, uh, in the beginning, I will start giving the floor to the first speaker, the first panelist. Again, the word panelist is not exactly uh, the, the real term, it's really a, an informed conversation that we are having today, is a conversation with uh, uh, high high level uh, specialists that will help us design a path, the, giving really a sense of direction to the project that Jonathan uh, has explained even better than I tried to do. Uh, so the first uh, speaker is Kathleen Bogiai. Uh, Kathleen is ambassador of Hungary. She was the 15th ambassador of Hungary to the United Nations and president of UNESCO 36th General Conference. Uh, Kathleen? Thank you very much. Uh, as I said, good morning or good afternoon from Hungary. It's great to, great to see you all. Uh, coming uh, and spending a lot of time at UNESCO, obviously, uh, and in the United Nations in New York, um, makes me think that our discussion today is really timely. And I would go back to this resolution we were talking about, because um, after the approach you were talking about in this resolution, for me, the main point is when it talks about the right of people to live in freedom and dignity, free from poverty and despair and from fear. And we live in a, I always say that today we live in, in a chaotic world. So the chaos is the order. It's a chaotic word, word and also it's a word without trust. Uh, just lately, um, uh, when um, uh, Secretary of State uh, George Schultz died when he was 100 years old, we welcomed him to the Foreign Policy Association. And actually he was talking about uh, the big lack of trust in every relationships, in families, in countries, between governments and people, between multilateral institutions and governments. And this lack of trust, I think, is what very much influences today the way of feeling, the way, the existence of the people as well. And um, another two starting point for me is that actually we are talking about a time in this chaotic world when COVID actually influences everybody. And just yesterday or the two days ago, um, just listening to uh, Antonio Guterres, uh, we just had a Security Council meeting on the vaccine equity, and he said that only 10 countries have administered 75% of COVID-19 vaccines, and 130 countries have no received a single dose. So how are we talking about this feeling of human security? If we don't even know that we will be vaccinated, we will be able to live in a safe world or not. So. Um, I think we have to look at this um, uh, problem from two sides, from uh, obviously uh, the global institution sides, what the roles can be, how multilateral diplomacy can um, uh, accelerate this process or make uh, build kind of trust and uh, understanding between peoples and cultures and nations, because we just remember why the UN was really set up. But also, we just know exactly that it's up to the relationship between the people and the governments, uh, how this trust can be uh, built up and how it can influence us, our way of feeling of secure or not. 
Um, I would uh, opt for a very strong solution, which starts with education, with strong um, political will and policies, and with strengthening uh, the cultural relations and cultural diplomacy. I very often felt that within the soft power, uh, cultural diplomacy was not taken into the right place because through the dialogue with culture, we can really build a kind of long time understanding, long time bridges between people. And if we want to really take it seriously, what this resolution is talking about, starting with human dignity, first of all, we can really, and we have to really build up the trust, the understanding, um, and, uh, and the personal dignity in people. So I would say uh, we have to look at this from the multilateral diplomacy perspective and of course uh, from national policies. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you very much for your perspective. Uh, I don't know if Jonathan, you want to come in with comments or should we uh, have them all together later on? Uh, I would like a very short comment here. Uh, George Schultz's wife has written a beautiful uh, eulogy and quoting him, and he, she calls it currency of the realm. And yeah, he was 100 when he passed away. And the entire essay, he describes different political systems and ideologies and his experience over all these years. And he says that, that when he walked into a room and there was trust, no matter how far the differences, progress could be made. And that when there wasn't trust, even if, even if they stated common purposes, no progress was made. And so he called it the currency of the realm and that building, building human trust he, he, that, it was as if his, his entire political ideology boiled down to, I've learned that trust is the most important quality in political discourse. It's very moving. Exactly. I, will, I will try and find it and, and share it with the, uh, with, yeah. with the report. Yeah, I mean, his, his last essay was, you know, on trust, this very big essay, and obviously what you were talking about, Jonathan, but of course he went uh, into his own experiences, but he went to our everyday life today, that this is the, like, we felt it at the UN, we felt at UNESCO, we feel it in, in, in bilateral, in multilateral diplomacy, the lack of trust. So this is very important how we are going to build it up because otherwise how we are going really to talk about the kind of dignity and security what we would like to provide or what we would like to feel provided uh, to people and for ourselves. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, the next one to speak is Maria Fernanda Espinoza. Uh, Maria, it's not the first time that we meet through this, uh, this facility. Uh, online, so now I, I I got to know you a bit, and uh, I know that you're extremely you're political, but you're also very practical. And if I want to uh, ask you something very specific, I'm sure you will cover that particular angle. Uh, I think we are searching for solutions. We are really looking for solutions. How to position human security higher on international agenda? And now we have a window of opportunity. So my question to you is what to do? What would you do? I mean, what uh, tips do you have for Jonathan, myself, Gary Jacobs, and the World Academy altogether in terms of setting in motion this project that we already, we are already doing it with the Human Security uh, Unit of the United Nations. But what do you think we could do more? Thank you, Maria. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Donato and, uh, and uh, Jonathan and, and Kathleen, of course. Um, uh, I, I was so used uh, when I was the president of the UN, uh, you know, to listen to the wisdom of, of Kathleen and, and her advocacy uh, towards cultural dip uh, diplomacy and soft power. And I learned a great deal from, from her, I have to say. Uh, you know, the, the power of soft power is uh, unbelievable. And I think that when we agree that we are suffering from a, a trust crisis, I think that that perhaps can be the antidote. And uh, 
I think that we need diplomacy more than ever. Uh, we need solidarity and cooperation more than ever. And we need to reconnect the bridges uh, for trust. And uh, this is not happening only uh, at, the, uh, at the national, at the international level. But uh, I was uh, looking at the um, uh, um, global values as um, tracker or report from Edelman. And it, and it is shocking to see that, uh, you know, uh, political parties enjoy 13% of public trust and uh, in half of the of people, of the people worldwide, half of them do not trust their parliaments. And, uh, you know, this is very problematic because the multilateral system is made of the political will uh, the uh, leadership of the sum of, of, of countries, of nations. And, and, uh, and of course, because of COVID, we have seen also the, the UN, the multilateral system struggle, you know, struggle uh, because of uh, it's being underfunded, because now when we see, uh, when we look at this so-called uh, vaccine nationalism, we see that we are in trouble. We see that in spite of COVAX, in spite of this platform, COVAX is underfunded and we see the wealthy countries buying five, five, five times more, you know, of the vaccine than what they actually need. They are pre-buying stocks just in case when, you know, the developing world doesn't have access and they have to perhaps wait until 2023, 2024. This is what the experts are saying. We just had a, a few days ago, a meeting of the Lancet Commission that I have the privilege to serve, the, the International uh, Lancet Commission on COVID. And it, it is worrisome. And, and here to respond to your question, Donato, a very concrete question. I think that the UN um, General Assembly resolution talks about human security as an approach. And, and uh, I would say it, it is much more than an approach. Uh, it has to be an overarching, all encompassing uh, concept uh, that has the, the potential to, to better respond to the current global crises and, and, and to guarantee you know, the, the survival, the livelihoods, the dignity of every human being. It is a concept that uh, recognizes the interlinkages and synergies between development, human rights and peace and security. So it is really a, an, an umbrella concept. Uh, you know, it is a comprehensive perspective, a holistic people-centered approach uh, that allows us, it's a toolkit, you know, to better assess, understand, and also, of course, transform the relationship between society, the economy, and our planet. It is a unifying framework that addresses the direct and, and root causes of insecurity. Um, so, and, and here I would like to, to echo what Kathleen uh, said uh, so beautifully, you know, paraphrasing President Roosevelt's uh, Four Freedoms. You know, human security speaks about freedom from want, from fear, and freedom to live with dignity. And I think we should uh, add this, uh, to these dimensions the freedom to live healthy and in peace and in harmony with nature. And, and I think that, you know, what can be more powerful, uh, you know, in today's world? I think that, uh, you know, human security should be connected to the shared responsibility that we have uh, over our commons, such as health, you know, health services and universal health coverage should be front and center of human security and be considered as a human right and a public good. You know, human, uh, a, a human security a overarching uh, approach to, should also address the climate crisis, of course. You know, we, uh, we, I don't need to convince you that this is really putting, you know, under threat the very existence uh, of uh, humankind. And, and the science has been so clear on that front. You know, if environmental degradation continues at, at current rates, uh, climate change will cause much greater social and economic damage 
than the one caused by COVID-19 itself. So I think that uh, a, you already spoke uh, about the billions uh, wasted you know, in weapons uh, and uh, industry of war and, and how, uh, you know, uh, ineffective in, ter in, in, in terms of, of, of the nuclear arsenals, how ineffective they have been as a deterrence uh, strategy. You know, it's really only putting in risk the entire humanity and that's it. So it doesn't make uh, much sense, especially in times of need. And, and I always recall what Itsumi Nakamitsu said, the, the UN High Representative on Disarmament Affairs. She said, you know, if only 10% of today's global military spending were spent uh, in, uh, the, in SDG 13 only on climate action. So the current costs of uh, adaptation and mitigation in developing countries would be cover, covered several times over. So I think that, um, when you say how to define human security, uh, you know, connected to climate, to, to connect it to our global commons, but also connected gender disparities. Uh, I think that uh, women and, and, and girls uh, are affected differently by conflict. And, and we know that. Uh, let's just speak the, the last data of, of 2019, uh, the United Nations documented uh, close to 3,000 cases of conflict-related sexual violence, of which 96% uh, targeted uh, women and girls. So these are uh, not, uh, you know, news uh, to all of you, of course, but we need to have a gender lens, a women's rights lens uh, within uh, the human security uh, umbrella uh, and, and, and concepts. And uh, just to close, uh, and since Donato challenged me, you know, to be uh, to be very practical, uh, you, there is a there is an idea that perhaps um, that is uh, um, uh, you know populating different spaces for discussion, and I think it, it deserves it, it deserves attention. If it, it, it deserves, uh, and it is uh, the creation of a potential global resilience council within the structure of the UN, following a little bit the path uh, of uh, the creation of the Human Rights Council, uh, you know, a few years ago. Uh, why? Because uh, uh, there has been a sense uh, that uh, there is a need for a high level intergovernmental body to address non-military global threats. Uh, with uh, mandatory powers uh, similar uh, to the ones of, of the Security Council. They are speaking about having a subsidiary body from the UN General Assembly called this Global Resilience Council, looking at conflict and crisis, but beyond, you know, the military, uh, the, 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 the military and um, and weapon-led kind of, uh, of conflict. And, and I think it is an interesting approach. This uh, a Global Resilience Council can be framed uh, under the umbrella of a, a human security perspective. Uh, there is a, a lot of writing that is happening as we speak on the idea of this uh, uh, Global Resilience Council. And that can be, you know, as an, an innovation, as an idea, to be fur further explored, uh, that could be as uh, something that we can collectively uh, perhaps think about. And the good news, in spite of the suffering of the losses of the vaccine nationalism and all of that, of the lack of trust, I think that the good news is that I feel there is momentum, there is a global appetite to, to see the multilateral system being retooled, genuinely retooled. Uh, the, the UN is currently undergoing a, a, a reform process, which is more technocratic. It's going to improve its delivery capacity. Kathleen has been part also of that uh, from the member states perspective, the, the management reform, the peace and security pillar reform, and uh, the development pillar reform. And I think that now 
because of the UN 75 a political declaration, there is a window of opportunity to think creatively, to ensure that we are better equipped and prepared. And when I say we, is the multilateral system, is the United Nations, that we are better prepared, better equipped to deal with crises. Now it is the COVID pandemic. Unfortunately, it seems like it's not going to be the last one to deal with a climate crisis, uh, to deal with a disasters uh, agenda in general, you know, to deal with a, a you know, non war, non uh, armed conflict related um, uh, security deficits. And uh, where, you know, diplomacy, uh, health diplomacy uh, is uh, front and center, where science diplomacy is also uh, front and center. So I wanted to leave you with this idea of the, of the Global Resilience Council and see how it flies. It can be interesting. And of course, uh, Donato and Jonathan are more than happy to have more, you know, brainstorming, uh, brainstorming opportunities for the survey and study on, on, human, on human security. Thank you. And, and back to you, Donato. Thank you, Maria. Thank you very much. Really inspiring and factual. And with this fantastic idea of the Global Resilience Council that uh, personally I didn't know about, uh, and I think would be uh, really the, the, the ideal uh, result and result of, of our project, or at least contribute, we, we could contribute to this. And therefore, we definitely need your leadership, Maria, uh, for our own project with human security. We count on you uh, to, to, be, uh, uh, to be supporting and, and participating directly. Because as you said, we need more brainstorming and we need uh, more activities. We have to plan activities, concrete activities around this particular concept. Jonathan, you want to come in now or, or later sure. as you prefer? Well, there, you know, uh, I couldn't agree more. Maria, by the way, is not only a great uh, intellectual leader and visionary, but she is also a secret poetess. And uh, we expect some poetry from you. Uh, uh, you know, like we're going to have to out you on this one. It's very, I think it's very important that the fullness of your capacity. Uh, uh, I totally agree with everything you said. And I wondered if you, the, 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 the secretary, the secretariat has a disarmament advisory board that sits perpetually. And I was thinking that maybe as an interim step to getting to a, a resiliency institutional structure that would deal with envi almost envi environment, hopefully one day a, 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 a human a, a institutionalizing traction to human rights, but to have a, uh, a human security advisory board for the secretary general that would meet regularly and, 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 and with, with, the, with the mandate of mainstreaming human security in the same way as gender equity has been mainstreamed and appropriately um, and rightfully so. I think human security has to be mainstreamed similarly so that in every effort it is addressed and cannot be marginalized to other, uh, other, other approaches. So, so uh, I really Thank am you soliciting your, uh, your leadership and engagement in this endeavor. Well, I understand we will have the opportunity to come back and I will uh, comment uh, on that, but thank you, thank you. And on the poetry next of- speak, Next one to speak, we will come to poetry later on. Next one to speak is Azita, Azita Berarawad, International Advisor on Global Governance, Development, Employment and Social Policy and Fellow of the World Academy. But she's also the former director of the Employment Department of International Labor Organization. I had the pleasure of working with Azita for many years. And in particular, we worked on a single instrument that deals with the resilience, with peace and decent work, uh, is the only ILO normative instrument that deals with this particular aspect that we revamped together. So Azita will probably also tell us something about uh, the employment dimension that I think we need to factor in, as we need to factor in other neglected areas of human security, neglected in the sense that are not yet uh, so 
self-evident. I mean, or, uh, evident, but not uh, not the, that prominent on the international agenda. Azita, it's nice to see you, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to welcome you. Thank you very much, Donato. Thank you. Greetings to you also. You and um, hello to all my co-panelists and attendees to this session. Um, as Donato put it, I have uh, more than 30 years of experience uh, in uh, policy development, uh, conceptual development and policy advice and implementation um, in the UN system at the ILO in particular. And uh, coming back to the topic that is uh, before us uh, on this nexus of peace and human security from different uh, vantage points on how practically in situations of peace building, you can bring together this uh, nexus of development, peace building and humanitarian assistance, because that has been the practical implementation of the concept of human security or attempts at bringing these three together. Challenges are very many. And the second uh, point has been in international negotiations on this recommendation that Donato uh, referred to, which is putting um, employment and decent work as one of those uh, major uh, wicked uh, issues that we have to face and the inequalities in access to economic justice or social justice at the forefront of, as root cause of conflict, of uh, polarization, but also as a solution for peace building and peace in the very broad sense of uh, not just lack of conflict, but social peace and political getting together. So I would just like to uh, make some remarks, which are you may find a little bit provocative. The concept of human security is not new, uh, as it was uh, um, reminded uh, by Jonathan, and by our uh, previous uh, distinguished panelists, uh, it has a life. And if we look at its life and generation in the UN system, uh, it was developed in the post-Cold uh, uh, War era. And as a way of um, bringing a human face, if I may say, into the security discourse. And to me, the most important value addition, normative value addition of the concept of human security is its linkage with security discourse. So as, as Jonathan was saying, um, the question is to say that security, national security, national sovereignty cannot be defined only in terms of state security, military, uh, security, but we have to look at human deprivations and a state obligation to fulfill human security. But sometimes we know that the state is the one which is attacking or threatening human security. So the question is, which state we are talking about and we human security of whom? So we have it, if we look back and if, if what's now is partnering with the Human Security Unit of the UN in advancing our thinking about the concept of human security, let us look also at the criticism of the concept because we have like 30 years of implementation. It's interesting to note the origin of it. It came both from the peace agenda, peacemaking agenda, um, discourse and programming and planning of the UN, as well as from the human development uh, report, especially the 1994 human development report that put the and character, try to characterize. Now, its practical implementation then has been really in the um, uh, pathway to peace building operations and how we should be looking at protracted 
crisis, conflict, internal civil strife, as well as cross-border uh, international conflicts, uh, not only in terms of stabilization, but bringing the entire uh, concept of freedom from want, freedom from fear, and freedom from indignity, actually, that has been uh, uh, added to this concept in the process of peacemaking making, and in the process of reconcil reconciliation. So I really think that the value addition of the concept, which remains to date very relevant, is using it in the discussions on security. Because if we want to look at it, the human security, let us then ask uh, in, in a broader sense of, of uh, COVID-19, obviously the, the biggest threat to human security or environmental uh, um, degradation or uh, uh, another big threat to human security, obviously nobody can deny that. But what I am questioning is what does it bring in addition to the sustainable development agenda or to, does it the sustainable development agenda contain all these elements, freedom from want, freedom from fear, freedom from um, indignity, as well as the full implementation of the comprehensive set of human rights, political and civil rights, as well as economic and cultural and civil. So my question is, are we adding another conceptual framework into, or are we putting it as an approach that sustains both sustainable development, uh, implementation of human rights in their, um, in their uh, totality, but also inject um, a, a human narrative into the security discussion and into the peacemaking processes. And let me also um, show there is, a, there is an abundant academic literature on the concept, on the sometimes lack of clarity of concept. There is an, a lot of performance analysis of practical implementation and difficulties in actually implementing in practice this whole notion of focusing on root causes um, and in particular socioeconomic grievances, poverty and inequality in the context of conflict and peacemaking. How can you deal with the short termism of emergency um, operations, humanitarian uh, operations at the same time? So it has become, confined to the lower denominator of doing no harm. So that, you know, what, you, what you're doing with your emergency relief operations, humanitarian assistance should not undermine longer term development cooperation. But also let us also face that the, context, uh, the concept has been contested in terms of some of the policy narratives that have been drawn from this now. Uh, that is the, the fate of any, any concept, no? But let's just take some of them. For instance, um, this whole notion of East-West understanding of the concept of human safety, but more importantly, I would say global North, global South, if, we, if these um, concepts still make sense in, in, in understanding the relationship, it has become, a manner of, in, especially in the peace uh, building um, uh, discourse and policy narrative, a, a kind of donor recipient um, uh, discussion in, in a sense that uh, we are concerned about human security over there because lack of these deprivation, uh, lack of these uh, fulfillment that deprivations are in fact a threat to are human security over here. And the discourse of, of course, migration and refugees, and we know how these narratives have been used, uh, you know, to, to 
feel, feed into some populist uh, approaches, which go against the concept of human security, but it is using that concept of human security and coming to some maybe other policy narratives that are less um, acceptable and, or highly contested. Another one is the whole notion of youth. You know, uh, we are youth and terrorism. And what does it have to go? It, it, it all comes from the notion of human security. And uh, actually it's interesting to look into the, 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 the policy narrative around youth empowerment and youth in global affairs. And you will see that there is on the one hand, this courting of youth, youth agency, youth participation, youth leadership, but also at the same time, victimization of youth but or youth perpetrators of violence and uh, of conflict. So I really think that we have to unlock this concept of human security, keep in mind the, the way this concept has been used uh, and see how we want to project it further in, in future uh, denominations. And I will just add 30 seconds. Uh, to me, uh, what it doesn't imply necessarily at first value is the whole notion of distributional justice. Because even if it is putting the emphasis on looking at root causes and multi-sectoral responses, uh, including uh, to socioeconomic grievances, it doesn't head on address the issue of inequalities. And I, if we have one of those very important wicked questions that we have to address is our inequalities. So are we gaining much by bringing human security without the inequality aspects, without the distributional justice, without the social justice aspect into the discussion. I leave it at that. Thank you, Azita. Thank you. You have covered so much that it would be very hard to wrap it up in one minute. Jonathan may try to do so. No, um, I'm not going. I, I'm not going. Yes, we have... I'm not going to try to wrap it up, but I'm going to give two comments. Uh, one of them, one of yeah. the issues that you that your life has addressed, Azita, is employment, and that goes very much to the heart of dignity in much of the world. And I just want to give a shout out to a civil society initiative that's been extremely successful in that area, called Education for Employment, that a real estate developer in New York, Ron Bruder, put together, that that is designed to educate and give job training to youth in uh, Jordan, Palestine, Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia, et cetera. And last year they did job training programs and then got employed over a hundred thousand people, 57% were women. And the reason he got involved in doing that was his concern for the security of Israel, that the best thing he could do was to help the economies and the social fabric of the neighboring countries. And I thought, boy, that's an example of human security. I fully, I fully agree with you. If I have just 30 seconds to, to reply back, I actually met with him and we discussed the FA program in, uh, in New York in, in September, 2017. So I'm very well aware. And if this goes at the heart. I, I hope I made myself understood in the sense that there is, a, there is a competition for paradigm, policy paradigms or approaches in this post-COVID momentum. So my, uh, what I'm trying to get at is it where we should rally against uh, which concept that has, is it about a new social contract, a new social compact? Is it about human security? Is it about SDGs plus? And, yeah. and so on. So that was my, my purpose in provoking the discussion. I want to respond directly to that and why mainstreaming it is so important. In other words, yes, we have to get into operational thinking and how do we, how, what is the value added of a comprehensive integrating concept? And I'll give you an example. 
In 2009, the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States came up with the conclusion that the greatest threat to national security was climate change. And their conclusion was, because of that, there's going to be social disruptions and we need more money to respond to new kinds of civil chaos, military responses to it. And I analogize that to my driving home and calling my wife and saying, darling, the steering wheel is loose on my car. Would you book me a room in the hospital? <laughs> Instead of, now if human security was mainstreamed, their response would have had to be, how do we deal with climate change and how does that affect people on this in their daily lives? But because they have no obligation to respond to that, they don't. They do have an obligation to respond to gender equity in the echelons of the military because that's been mainstreamed. So if we mainstream the concept of human security, that response that they gave would have been patently unacceptable. And that's one of the values added that it creates a point of reference for institutions. So it's, it is the power of an idea and, and, and then it becomes operational. But first we have to say, this is an idea that we believe in, one, because it's true. Just like it's true that women have to be equal in power to men in our institutions. Next one to speak, now that we have touched upon so many issues of equity included, I mean that I have also um, flashed out at the beginning, you, is it referred to inequality as a, a serious mm -hmm. uh, hampering element of uh, advancement for, for the constables, for the approach of human security. I think that we also have someone next, that is Professor Dujan Vujovic, that is a, an expert on uh, local economic development, besides being former minister of Serbia and was fellow. So he will tell us also about uh, his perception of human security and uh, how can you advance that at local level. I think this is uh, uh, fundamentally important, uh, not just the overarching policy issues, but the local level. Dusan, to you, thank you. Um. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we, we are obviously very short of time, so let me let me uh, uh, try and keep it very tight. Uh, uh, let me start with the, with the phrase of my friend here. I spent uh, 9,000 days working for the World Bank before retiring and, and taking on this finance, finance minister position in Serbia. And one of my colleagues at the end of our long, exhausting missions, where I understand we were dealing with the economic side of, of peace and security all the time without specifying uh, things that you so eloquently uh, expressed today. He said, in the end, when everything is said and done, much more was said than done. So the, my, my intention here is to try and give some directions as to what can be done to move from this situation. Let me quote Gary in his uh, four or five year old article on, on peace and security. He was talking about missed opportunities. And obviously the big one was after World War II when the existing multilateral system was created in the way it which was created, okay? With the, with the Security Council being both enabling and blocking institution with the world divided as it is. We can try, we can do as many tries as we want until we change some of those basic premises. We can get only, only this far, you know? So some things have to be, have to be uh, understood the way they really are in, in real world. Uh, but what is more important for me is that what, what Donata, you said at the beginning, there are, there are, in addition to this general peace and security considerations, which are defined negatively, as peace being the absence of war and security being your ability to fight back, your ability to retaliate, we need a positive concept. So leaving aside the multilateral diplomatic puzzle, we need to change our own, our own view of things. And quite a few of you, I will not uh, attribute this to individual speakers, spoke about education and spoke about reach. So let me talk about two aspects of reach and education. Uh, uh, physical reach is getting to people who need it. I spent, as I said, many years at the World Bank, and we end up going to capital cities and maybe to next cities in the, uh, of size in, in a different country. And 
admittedly, I, I started my career at the World Bank by going to Sierra Leone, and I'm now as a retired consultant going to Sierra Leone, and we are not getting beyond, beyond 50,000 people cities. We are not getting to the last guy who needs help, who needs to be protected in his basic needs. And then let me put one of the probably the big, uh, biggest breakthroughs that the World Bank has done over the years, which is identify that you need to start building human ability as an intrinsic part of their security and, and their ability to deal with the world at the preschool age. So we computed that you get 10 times higher returns on every dollar invested in preschool education age two to five to six. Not only that, but this we, we, con we concluded was the major factor in promoting gender equality. You provide mothers with an opportunity not to interrupt their careers for five or six years, but co confidently give their kids to professionals which can identify their abilities, develop their musical, economic, uh, science abilities early in life. There are certain areas where this is happening, like in sports, like in chess and so forth, where others are doing it outside of the system. Imagine the impact that this will have if we were to do it on our own. The second important thing I, I believe is that today, the new opportunity is because the world has been challenged in the way it operates. So COVID is, a, is a both a threat, but also a, an opportunity to re-examine certain things. And from my point of view, to re-examine certain basic stuff about economics. Economics was defined at the time when Newton methods were used in physics. Physics has changed tremendously. Economics has not changed. Okay. So if somebody uh, was to, were to use Newton's proofs today, would be laughed out of TV or show or books or whatever. And we, we economists are using the same concepts. The second aspect was that it was, it was defined at the time of the first and second industrial revolution to promote early entrepreneurship, to promote industrial development, to promote creation of goods. We are no longer in a situation we can have uh, uh, iPhone and Samsung and others produce three, four new generations of, la of, of smartphones before we can learn to use the existing generation. So the, the production of goods is no longer a constraint. Production of agricultural goods has not been a constraint for quite a while. So the issue somebody mentioned very nicely, the issue of employment. So we need to change the concept. Our, our traditional concept of employment is state, corporate sector, and we allow some private sector, but also in a commercial way. What about social employment? What about, what about people who have time, retired people with lots of knowledge who can contribute? What about people in many areas that we cannot reach? World Bank, uh, $1,000 per day wage and, uh, and $5,000 per day total cost cannot go to 500 people village in Africa and, and, and build their knowledge, build their ability to deal with the present world. I believe that uh, that maybe uh, I'm not endorsing, using this to endorse the, the great reset that, that, that Charles Schwab is, is arguing for, but basically to, to think in those terms. He's asking that we rethink markets and what needs to be done for markets not to behave in a, in a predatory, wild, unstable way. What can be done to direct investment, not only towards make maximizing profit, at the, at the cost of, of environmental uh, degradation and the cost of, of increased inequality and the cost of poor education, but the other way around, to integrate all those things in investment and use our subsidies, not to subsidize wrong enterprises, but to subsidize or co-fund green, green technology to co-fund things that are user-friendly for education, for environment. We know all of this but it doesn't happen. My experience as the Minister of Finance was I spent 20% of the time discussing the social budget, maybe 20% of the time discussing all other things and 50% of the time fighting the military and the police because they believe that they have an upper hand. So the issue somebody mentioned here, they are selling you security. They are selling you uh, the, the, the cloud of 
if you want security, this is how much you will have to put down. Yes, we want security, but we want to negotiate the security. I wanted to add one more thing. In order to build trust, you have to teach people not to fear. And they will not fear if they are conscious of the world, they're conscious of their own abilities, and they're able to do this. In the world that is moving towards new huge migrations, getting quality human factor, I think is critical not to perceive migrations as a threat, but to perceive them as something that was the core. US is the country of immigrants. I'm new in this country, I've, I came in 79. And now, and now the, for four years, we were fighting the cost of somebody wanted to push everybody out. Uh, the, the whole idea is, is, is despicable. To walk, wanting to push out somebody who broke the law is different from wanting to push out or restrict all, all the immigrants. So my, my five cents is we need to use the great reset, which is uh, in a figure of speech, to enter uh, in a powerful way concerns of peace and security, uh, uh, intertwine this with economics and try and do something to, uh, uh, to help these people not face gang violence and peer pressures in school. This is where your security starts at an early age. Instead of that, promote the ability to become good humans and then develop it. And then you will find your Nobel Prize winners in the middle of nowhere uh, of today's world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I would have a lot to say about what you have stated. I mean, uh, it's uh, a panoply of things that are wonderful in a sense because you're opening a Pandora box of, of things. Uh, I mean, uh, what comes to my mind when you spoke about Sierra Leone, I mean, I remember the, the total lack of infrastructure. I mean, uh, uh, this was a few years ago. I don't know how is the situation nowadays, now that you're still working as a consultant in, in Freetown. It's, it's the same. I, I it's the same. We build, we build. It's the same. Of the it's, it's exactly Just the same. Just wanted to add one so, sentence. It's the same. We build the road, but seasonal access to uh, infrastructure is the same because the rainy season comes and the road is gone. It's, it's flushed out. So we know. So you have pinpointed to so many important issues that are core to human security, and then we have to uh, certainly factor in. Uh, Dushan, you will be a, an active uh, uh, player in our project. I hope because we definitely need you. Jonathan, you want to add something? I, I do, but I but time is not our friend, and I'm going to. Yes, I really want. Speakers, I, I just want to emphasize. I just want to emphasize that uh, Tibor is a relatively humble person, and he actually uh, created an organization that exemplified the kind of global cooperation uh, that, uh, that we need, that ended up doing all kinds of successful things that were not expected uh, with the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization. So that means that now the next one to speak is Tibor. Uh, that I also had the pleasure to work with in The Hague when I uh, was with the Chemical Weapons uh, Disarmament Organization. Uh, Tibor, uh, to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Uh, nice to see friends and colleagues. Um, uh, let, let me offer an additional conceptual framework for the sake of um, the discussion. And uh, Based on some previous comments I uh, made during the last couple of days, I would like to bring up a hypothetical, a hypothetical future unseen for the last 100, 130 years, four or five generations since the first half of the 20th century. And uh, why I feel for our discussion and for the continuation of the discussion you will have this conceptual framework, additional conceptual framework is needed because I feel that the security concept, peace and security alone, or the security concept as embodied in the human security, none of them are adequate in themselves to enable us to understand fully where we are and where we are going long-term, the secular perspective, and the tools we need, and the critical time frame for action. 
So what I would describe is age of change management. And when I speak about the age as the first component, I'm referring more to ages. Uh, to uh, give the example, old age is second half of the 20th century, the ongoing age practically, and the passage from the old age to the new age. And the new age for me is the second half of the 21st century, second half of the 21st century. And the old age is third industrial revolution, but not just that, with all the zeitgeist, the, uh, the spirit of the age, uh, attributions, social, economic, and cultural. And the new age uh, with many simplifications, fourth industrial revolution, and its future attributes, still we do not know. What is more important for me, because many are uh, addressing the, the old and the new, the period in between, this change, this passage, so, and I would like to a bit hypothesize the, and, and it's risky because I, I have to put in time boxes, uh, periods behind us and in front of us. That, uh, that, is, that will be a long period potentially, that passage, that age of change. And because of the length of it, it deserves its own categorization as an age of change in between the old one, the ongoing one and the new one. And in a way, change of age is a euphemism. Why it is a euphemism? Because the last time societies tried to manage a change of age can be dated back to one day 20 years to the whole of the first half of the 20th century from the beginning until the 1950s. Uh, one historian, and uh, I do not necessarily share the ideological uh, uh, approach, but Hobsbawm called that half a century age of change, the age of catastrophe. The age of catastrophe in singular as a continuum of calamities. And uh, the, the previous one, if, uh, if there is a need for a reference point, probably happened uh, 120 years before that, in between 1789 and 1848, uh, or if you would like to capture US and, and Japan between the 1860s, okay? Another uh, 50, 70, 80 years. Nowadays, the age of change in between where we are and the fourth industrial revolution and all the attributes, this age is changes falling through the cracks. It's not present in all conceptual secular models. And uh, historically, as uh, the two reference points are representing, these were ages of calamities and Again, this is being ignored by economists, ignored by financial, industrial, and technological experts. Rightly so, because we need all the momentum and the drive and the, and the positive approach to things. But as one of the futures, this age of change might be peppered with uprisings, with revolutions, and with counter-revolutions and civil wars and wars and major wars, and as it happened in those period, with everything mixed together, not managed by anyone. Uh, on the management, just quickly, um, I think there are important counter-cyclical measures on their way. And, and of course, when I mentioned that there is a need to address these age of change management issue, the idea is not to take away oxygen, not to take away oxygen from the Paris Convention implementation, not to take away uh, oxygen from the SDG implementation or the Sendai framework 
disaster risk reduction implementation. All of them uh, are, or many of them up to 2030. And the question is, do we have the time for the other wicked issue? Because I, I think wicked issue is an understatement here. If, if the uh, worst case scenario is unfolding, do we have nine years to go? Do we have seven or eight years to go? No one knows. So the, the idea is to somehow manage um, early on, even just moving the needle degree by degree, not more necessarily, but starting to move the, the, the needle for, for, all those, for all those who historically have been not just winners of those changes, the new age winners, but all the losers who are there, be it in the economic sphere, be it in the social sphere and its subspheres, finance and technology and culture. So this is, this is a very, very difficult task in, for to, in, in front of us. You might ask the question, okay, what can we do? I think based on the time frame, top-down mobilization, as it, is, as it was foreseen by Oppenheimer 60 years ago and, and, and other top scientists, mobilizing the cream of the scientific community, focusing as a laser beam on this issue and, and these challenges. In addition to that, like on climate change and incrementally happening on SDGs, a top-down mobilization of leaders, a top-down mobilization of uh, the business and the financial uh, community in the context as an example of the environmental, social and governance disclosures, the sustainability disclosures. One practical mobilization tool idea I'm right now trying to launch is working on with a few potential partners, a series of age of change stress tests. Age of change stress tests. Okay, stress tests are becoming the most important tool in the toolbox of banks, central banks, and institutions overseeing like the Bank of International Settlements and the European Central Bank. And the uh, governments are paying attention to the outcome of those stress tests. So this sphere of age of change, though it's a longer term issue, it's more secular, but it can impact already us tomorrow, okay? As, as the first calamities, the uprisings are there already in, a, in an embryonic form. So this stress test could be underpinned by cutting edge um, uh, tools like agent-based modeling. But what is important, we do not say that this time is different or we do not try to have the day after type of revisiting the complexities. Thank you so much, thank you. Thank you, Tibor, thanks a lot. Uh, would have a lot to comment about your excellent presentation and, and vision, but we do not have time. Jonathan, you will come in at the end now. Uh, we will go for the next speaker because we have very little time five minutes to the closing, but we will extend it to further five minutes. Uh, first one to speak is Alan. Alan Ware is another great expert on uh, disarmament affairs. Uh, he is, in fact, the global coordinator of parliamentarians for nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. Alan, to you to add your version of the story. Uh, thank you very much, Sonato and Jonathan. Uh, I'm going to comment on three aspects of this question. The first is uh, human security versus military security. The second is the importance of including common security. And the third is the importance of futures thinking. So on the first, uh, human versus military security. I think that the climate crisis, the pandemic, uh, and the rise of cyberspace have demonstrated very clearly uh, the importance of human security and the limits to military security. 
you know, the combined military forces of the world, the, none of the nuclear weapons could stop the spread of the Corona-19 pandemic around the world, nor could really do anything to address the public health and the economic uh, implications and impact um, of that virus. Similarly with climate change, the militaries are not able to address the climate change despite their, the, the way they're approaching it as the way what Jonathan talked about. Um, indeed, the, the huge investments in military and the military operations contribute uh, to climate change. So it's given a huge opening for us to be able to make a difference and to start shifting that current emphasis on investments and priorities that are in governments on military to security, the $1.9 trillion that are invested every year in the militaries, the $100 billion that are invested in nuclear weapons. We have a big opportunity now to work with parliamentarians and with civil society who are more aware and also more connected to be able to cut the military budgets, cut the nuclear weapons budgets, and put the, these financial and human resources into the human security framework. Um, and so that's why we're very happy to be part of the move the nuclear weapons money program which is doing that the second point on common security i think we need to in, to embrace the common security framework as well as the human security frame, framework if you're just talking about human security it puts us in competition or at odds with those who believe that national security is still important and i'm amongst those i still believe that national security is important uh, but when you embrace the common security approach you're then also addressing the issues about national security, how to deal with aggression, how to deal with military threats, threats, how to deal with the conflicts between countries, and they are very real conflicts, and it provides alternatives to military approaches to those specific aspects of security which is still important to address. So we need to highlight the mechanisms of the United Nations, the arbitration, adjudication, the courts that are available to address uh, conflicts and address uh, key issues, uh, the, the the possibilities to use uh, cooperative security mechanisms like the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. This is really important to have human security as part and parcel of the human security framework. And finally, futures thinking. We need to bring futures thinking into our, our planning and consideration. Too often, we just focus on what's right ahead of us, right in, the, in front of us. Um, and just dealing with the issues of today is not sustainable. And it's just dealing with short-term short thinking is what uh, sets problems for us. Futures thinking helps us get out of that. Again, it helps to move away from you know, the blame as to why we got into the mess we're in the world at the moment and look at how can we have, build a better future. So it gives us a much greater opportunity to engage with those who might not think exactly the same as us. Uh, to engage with those who we need to ensure are at part of the solutions for the future. It gives us opportunities to highlight effective policies which have positive impact on the future and to curtail policies that have a negative impact on the future. And it gives us opportunities for serious and effective intergenerational engagement. So I think those three things are really key. You know, the, the, the opportunities we have to shift from a primarily military to a human security and common security approach and the need for futures thinking. And I'm very happy that with the futures thinking, World Academy of Arts and Sciences is engaged very much in this and as such as co-sponsoring World Future Day on March the 1st, a 24 hour around the world global conversation, which I hope many of the people on here will also engage in to take these ideas forward. Thank you very much. Ali, thank you. Thanks a lot. And uh, also thank you for referring to this concept of common security and all the rest. You, as all the others, remember, please, you are enrolled for the project that we are conducting, the global campaign that we want to enact uh, in a few months to come. So please stand ready to uh, have an active part in this project of the World Academy. The last one to speak, I'm sorry to say, because uh, the time is... Uh, uh, is really lapsing fast, is Yuri Sayamov, uh, who is a scientist, he's also a, a diplomat, uh, and uh, he uh, still teaches, I uh, think, at the Faculty of Global Processes of Moscow University. Yuri, uh, thank you for adding your perspective. Thank you, thank you, Donata. Uh, greetings to all co-panelists. And uh, 
I'll make it short because uh, there is a shortage of time. Anyway, Donato, you invited uh, to speak about not so known sides of this problem of human security and uh, even neglected sometimes. And um, I would say that uh, there is a danger of intellectual degradation of humanity. And uh, I believe it is uh, very dangerous. Maybe it is uh, threat number one, because uh, we have to see what is uh, going on in the contemporary world. There is a growing alienation. There is frustration, a humanization, and finally, the socialization of people. The moral ethical principles on which the construction of human society, of the whole, let us say, building of it was based, are going to be destroyed. And instead, alternatives are offered that contradict to the very nature of a human being and to, its, to his life destination. Uh, what is the reason for it? And why I consider it a very high danger for the humanity? First, it is uh, the decreasing quality and quantity of education. I am very sorry to say it, but uh, young people are much more ignorant than the previous uh, generations. There are many reasons. There is an uh, uh, absence of, uh, let us say, habit to read, absence of listening. Uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, information which is uh, presented to young people instead of education. And uh, this is why I think we have uh, to consider this problem because uh, I cannot speak longer in details. There are many details, very interesting details. But somehow we have also, in my opinion, to uh, put some attention to the notion of the uh, so-called uh, social uh, intellectual uh, component of civilization. Because uh, there are some distinctions between the individual uh, intellect, between group intellect and between social intellect. And uh, uh, very important for the state of uh, human security is the situation with the public or social uh, intellect. Because, uh, uh, Gary, at the beginning of our session today, he mentioned just briefly the problem of the human gap. It is a very important problem. For the first time, it was described, if I am not mistaken, in 1979 in uh, one of the reports to the Club of Rome. But today, somebody already mentioned uh, this story with uh, uh, mobile phones, uh, with gadgets, and so on. It is true. It is a good illustration. Uh, the human being cannot cope with the speed of the change of the world and with the complexity it gains ever more. Even when you buy a new telephone, you have to cope with it. You, you need some days to get accustomed with it. And uh, for some users like me, I can never be uh, totally uh, informed about all the uh, abilities which are inserted in this uh, device. It is just an illustration. But uh, I think uh, following the very important uh, topic of uh, human security. And I really congratulate the Academy for raising this problem. And uh, Donata knows we made a couple of events 
to speed up somehow the understanding of uh, this problem. We organized a joint event in May and in December devoted to human security on the platform of the Moscow State University. I am very grateful to Donato for his moderating of one of the sessions. It was a very interesting and uh, also fruitful discussion because uh, so many people, they uh, sometimes do not understand the whole scope of this problem. And uh, I mentioned just one uh, part of it. I selected it because it is a little, let us say, uh, little spoken about and uh, mentioned, but important in my opinion. But colleagues spoke about many other things. And I would be very, actually, uh, Tibor spoke about what I was going to speak also. We need to restore scientific diplomacy. Scientific diplomacy of Dr. Uh, Bernard Russell, of uh, Albert Einstein, of Oppenheimer, of Kapitza, of many other people. That's why, uh, that time, I mean, after the Second World War, there was a necessity to mobilize the scientific community because the scientists who explored the uh, nuclear, uh, let us say, who created the nuclear uh, weapon, they first asked the governments to speed up the process of uh, all these works on this topic because uh, it was needed to stop the Hitlerite aggression. But after it was defeated, the same scientists, they asked their governments never to use uh, the discoveries, never to use the nuclear weapon. And unfortunately, it was done, but fortunately, only once. And today, when the dangers and uh, threats are multiplying, when they are not less dangerous than the nuclear weapon, for example, COVID has shown that uh, bacteriological weapon can kill the humanity not less effective than the nuclear one. And this is why uh, we have really, I agree fully with Tibor, we have to undertake uh, strong efforts to mobilize scientific community to oppose the dangers and to save the world and the humanity. Thank you so much. Yuri, uh, Yuri, thank you very much. Thank you for your intervention, your ideas referring to education. That is obviously a, a very poignant issue that needs to be uh, addressed through our work even more. Uh, as we don't have time, uh, we really run out of time. I will just give the floor to the co-moderator, Jonathan Granoff, that you all know, president of the Global Security Institute and uh, academian, as we all are. Uh, Jonathan, to you for the closing. Uh, Yuri, it's interesting. One of the things that Donato and I had planned was we have a short dialogue between the very uh, famous actor, Michael Douglas, and Dr. Joseph Rotblat, one of the very scientists who founded the Pugwash movement, one of the people who founded the World Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the singular scientist who walked off the Manhattan Project precisely because he, he saw the moral and practical dangers of nuclear weapons. And hopefully we'll be able to run that short thing tomorrow because it goes right to the heart of, of the issue. He was one of the drafters of the very famous uh, manifesto that ends, remember your humanity, forget the rest. And of course, that goes to the opening presentation we had on the, on the importance of the currency of the realm, which is trust. And uh, refocusing on human security is exactly based on building a different framework of how we pursue security. We never talked about, we never talked about the core insecurity, the core insecurity that every human being faces, which is the fact of our mortality. 
and the, the fear of mortality and the insecurity uh, facing death and the attempts that people engage in to address that core existential insecurity. And it's often centered around identity, identity of religion, identity of state, identity of an institution or something that will transcend their individual existence and how powerful that motive is, how powerful institutions are that address that core insecurity, which, is, which is, has to be transformed with a new consciousness of our global human community that we can no longer utilize uh, provincial identities to divide us, but we can find within the great religious traditions principles that do build human qualities and trust. That, that dimension we never touched on, but it's very important because religious and ethnic violence cannot be ignored. I wanna just juxtapose this issue of trust with the greatest institutionalization of distrust, which are nuclear weapons. General Lee Butler, who was in charge of the targeting and readiness of the entire American nuclear arsenal in criticizing nuclear weapons policy and demanding progress on abolition said that the worst part of nuclear weapons is it codifies mankind's most murderous instincts as an acceptable resort. And I would say that in addition to the extraordinary economic expenditures, the codification of our most murderous instincts and institutionalization of the nuclear arsenals, the, 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 the institutionalization based on fear and threat and deterrence is with terror, deterrence is, it's a realm of terror. And the greatest cost is the barrier to the cooperation that's needed to address pandemics, climate, the health of the oceans, et cetera. And so the power of the idea of a human security shift cannot be underestimated because it, it can be, it can incorporate that positive vision that is rooted in our, the very first word, our humanity, rather than other less universal principles. I was particularly uh, moved by the, by the emphasis on the importance of periods in our life in which we're not producers and consumers. Between the ages of two to five and when we get older, that, uh, uh, that it, in fact, the security of a society is largely determined by how people are treated between the ages of two and five. And, uh, and, and yet that's, that's rarely addressed in the, in the dialogue on, on how human security and resilient societies are, are created. The closing presentation on the, uh, the two closing presentations, I thought uh, Tibor's point of looking, you know, taking the lens of how we're looking at our historical period and learning from our past mistakes is of inestimable importance and should never be marginalized. And I was thinking of the, the examples of, of, of how horrific, uh, horrific killing took place in the two world wars that gave rise to the need of the UN system and how they were both based totally on mythical thinking that ignored the real human needs of the people in the countries that generated those wars. And that, that, that if we uh, fail to learn from those mistakes and we just pretend as if history is not something that, uh, that we carry with us, how mistaken we will be. And then of course, uh, Alan Ware's uh, emphasis on approaching military security based on cooperative, finding cooperative principles. And we even saw that recently in um, in the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, how, the, uh, how to, uh, to I mean, give credit to Russia bring, invoking the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe to help address the issue. And that uh, I believe it's going to be successful that we prevented a, a, the war from really getting out of, 
out of hand. It could have, I saw that as a stress test because we could have had a NATO country, Turkey, involved in direct military conflict with a non-NATO country. And that could have, that's exactly how World War I began. So finding these cooperative links and emphasizing them cannot be underestimated. And last but not least, the critique of, in, of the a lack of intellectual uh, rigor and, and seeing that as so important in any society as, you know, as the resource being the next generation. And um, the, it is not just, I, I have to say, Professor, that uh, I was a lecturer at Seliger, the, uh, the, the, youth, the, the, the youth elite camp in Russia twice. And I saw an extraordinary, the extraordinary intellectual capacity of the elite Russian youth. And I've seen the same thing in Nanking at the university there. And I've seen the same thing at universities in Mexico City. I've seen the same thing in the universities of the United States, the, the, the top ones. And you see this a cosmopolitan class of young people who really understand the unity of the human family. But then when I went into the villages, and if you go into the villages, so to speak, of the United States, you see this huge gap this huge gap of people who feel that modernity has passed them by and they don't, and they're desperately looking for direction. They don't trust the old religious institutions. They definitely don't trust their governments. They don't trust their leaders. They don't have a narrative that gives them meaning and they don't see how they fit into the future. And this is a global inequity of education so one of the sessions that has taken place over the last few days has focused on the need for a global, a global perspective in education. We need to teach uh, children civics as to how their own governments work. But we also need, we need an educational system that focuses on what are the global needs. And that's what brings us back to the human security agenda that it focuses on education, health, the daily lives of people. And the daily lives of people are impacted as never before by global threats. So the, the global threats, the dark side of the global threats obviously is the existential threat to our human community. The light side is that it forces us to start to think together. And that comes back to remember your humanity. And what makes us human, of course, is uh, caring for others as we care for ourselves, caring for our neighbor. And I would propose that in today's world, neighborhood is not a physical place, but a moral location. And our moral location has become global. And uh, I thank the organizers for bringing us together and look forward to galvanizing the extraordinary intellectual and wisdom capacity of the World Academy to help make this shift to a more humane perspective on how the world pursues security. The more humane perspective certainly is what we all want. Uh, thank you all. Thank you all for attending today and let's continue to stay connected on this theme.